Thank you all for joining us today for our tree and shrub pruning program. I'd like to introduce to you Dave Gamstetter. He was the urban forester for the city of Cincinnati for over 33 years and is now a project development person for Davy Resource Group. So without further ado, I will turn it over to Dave. Thanks, Chris. Thank you. So how many of you have actually pruned trees before and thought you knew pretty much what you were doing? That's good. That's a good, good percentage. So um, the, the key to pruning is just learning a few basic things, being smart, being safe, and then just doing it. It takes a lot of time, experience to see how trees respond to what we do to them. Trees are very responsive. Um, and so when you, before you even start though, you need to have some idea of what you're trying to achieve. Are you trying to make it safe? Are there broken branches in it? Are there dead limbs that could fall on somebody or something? Are there low branches? Or maybe it's just a nuisance issue, like it's, it's brushing up against the side of your house and, and rubbing off the paint. So when you prune, you have to start making decisions going into it. Where do I start? What am I trying to accomplish here? And then, and then have basic ideas of where you want to go with it. So today we're going to cover a lot of the basics. Um, we're going to start with safety. Uh, safety is always the most important thing. And then we're going to talk about pruning basics, uh, where to prune, where the branch bark collar is and the branch bark ridge and how to do subordination pruning, um, how to do a three-point cut so that we don't damage the bark of the tree when we take off a branch. And then um, uh, the five steps of pruning, training young trees. It's the most important time to prune a tree. You can make big cuts. You can take off a higher percentage of the wood because the tree is young and, and actively grown and can recover. Once trees get large, there's not sometimes we can't make the pruning cuts that we need to, to make them safe or make them last longer. So um, sometimes we have to prune trees to overcome problems in the past. Um, we'll talk a little bit about co-dominant leaders and issues with, with that, um, with bark that's actually growing between the two leaders. And as it grows each year, it tends to split apart. And sometimes we'll see that in a storm, especially, you know, the old calorie pears that are now banned in Ohio, at least. Um, we see them after a storm and they're, they're split in half and you think, you know, the storm did that. Well, really, the tree was predisposed to that happening to it. So we'll talk a little bit about that. Stubs. If we leave parts of branches on a tree, that can be a pathway to um, introducing decay and insects and pest problems. So we'll talk about a little bit about that and then the tools that we use. So today we brought, um, we brought a pruning saw, pruners, loppers, and a pole saw. And if we get good weather, we'll go outside and we'll actually make some cuts and we'll show you um, where you should be removing tree branches from and talk about trees and form and shape and growth and where we would wanna make those cuts, what, what makes the most sense. So um, most injuries happen when pruning with extremely sharp tools. These are designed to cut through wood. So you know they can cut through your finger with no problem. So it's important when you are pruning, most important is always know where both of your hands are. You don't wanna get this hand too close to this hand and cut it when you're cutting a branch. So that's the most important thing, but we also need to be careful about having firm footing, making sure that we don't cut branches overhead that could fall on us or poke us in the eye. And um, the, the key, one of the main keys is first is to make sure you have very sharp tools. Um, this one has a folding, folding blade and you can see it's locked. You have to make sure that's locked because if it's not, it can fold up on your hand and cause big problems. The other thing is you should have gloves on when you're pruning. And I don't know that we brought gloves, Chris. That might be something we could have to struggle with a little bit. Um, and then pruners, we want the kind that are bypass pruners. It should go past, it should go past the edge of the pruner, not ones that come down and, and hit it in the middle and smash it. That damages the tissue, doesn't make a clean cut. So they should always be what's called bypass pruners. 
so that it goes on the other side. And I can pass these around if you want to look at them. So um, most injuries, as I said, are lacerations, um, people cutting themselves, getting their fingers in the way, um, either of the pruning blade or with the saw or not having it properly locked open. But other examples of injury can be falls, um, slips, head or eye injuries, cutting branches down and having it poke you in the eye. So safety glasses are, are, are a good idea if you have them. Um, and strain to shoulders and back and repetitive motion, especially if you're using pole saws. I didn't bring mine in. It's, it's big and I didn't think I should have it in here, but um, when you're doing pole printers and things, it can be, it can be pretty strenuous. So um, the most important thing is to understand how trees heal. Trees don't actually heal. Um, when we prune a tree, we are removing living tissue on the outside edge of the branch. And it's important for us to make that pruning cut where the tree has the ability to create new, what's called wound wood, that grows over that cut and closes it. So if we look at this, this image up here, um, you can see where the branch, I don't know if you can see my arrow, where the branch bark collar is. So this, I'm gonna have to walk up here. Is it gonna follow me, Chris? Um, so it is. this is the branch. Branch bark collar right here, and this is the branch bark bridge. And those are both important things to look for when you're looking at the tree and figuring out where to cut it. So we want to prune it right along this line, along the branch bark collar. This gives the tree the best opportunity to generate wound wood. And actually, the wound wood begins to grow when we introduce oxygen to it. It's kind of an interesting thing. Um, this, the edge of this um, wood starts to form wound wood and it grows over the cut removed branch. And I'll show you what that looks like in a minute. So these are simple diagrams. Um, you can see different ways to make cuts. The typical one is on the upper left-hand corner with the branch bark ridge, the branch collar. It shows you where to cut it, a plane from the edge of the branch bark ridge across the collar. If we cut too close into the collar, we're actually removing the tissue that helps to heal up the cut. So we wanna make sure we're right along that edge. Um, and then if we don't have a visible collar, like the one on the upper right corner, um, if there's not a visible collar, we can't see exactly where that tree shown us where it wants to be pruned. We still line it up with the branch bark ridge and we come down on, a, on an angle. So you can see the other ones at the bottom, um, kind of the same, the same idea. We always wanna know where, that, where the branch bark collar is and where the branch bark ridge is located. So this one, uh, this is a proper pruning cut. This is the way it's supposed to look. So you can see we've got the, we've got the collar there, starting to make a cut from the top down. Um, typically when you do this, you would support the branch with one hand and prune with the other one if it's a small branch. If it's a large branch, we're gonna make three cuts to remove it. And I'll show you that in a moment. But that is a proper cut right there on the bottom. We have a very small wound. Uh, we, we didn't cut into the collar. So the collar, now that we're introducing oxygen to the tissue around it, it's gonna to start to create wound wood and grow over top. So this is what it should look like about a year after you make the pruning cut. So you can see it looks like a donut, and as it grows together, um, it will eventually seal off that wound. It's not healing it, it's just closing it off. So if we have a big, a large branch, we need to remove that with three cuts. The first one should be out away from the trunk a little bit, and it's an undercut. So you can see the picture on the left, He's actually cutting underneath the branch. You go up about a third of the way through the branch. And then the next cut is outside of that, like in the middle. And you cut it from the top down and then it, it 
breaks off where we scored it from underneath. And what that does is it keeps the branch from peeling bark off down the trunk of the tree as it tears away. If you've ever pruned, you've probably done that. I know I've made that mistake. Even though I try to do it the right way, sometimes it still happens. But the idea is to do the three-point system to minimize that. And this one, if, even if it's a larger branch, you don't have to support it. We're doing the three cuts, so it's not going to tear off. It's a small branch, you support it with one hand, and that way you're not causing the bark to peel down the tree. Make sense? Any questions so far? Okay, great. So this is what happens if we don't make the three-point cut. We can see it tore the bark out and peeled it down the bark, creating a very large wound that the tree really has a hard time sealing over. Extremely difficult for that tree to heal that wound. Um, the other thing sometimes we need to reduce the height for a couple different reasons. Sometimes we have a tree with two, two main leaders and we've let it go too long and we can't remove one of them because we'd be removing half of the tree at one point in time. So this is known as subordinating cuts. If we reduce the height of that tree that the, of one side, leave the other one the same, we can reduce its ability to compete with the other one, and the tree focuses more energy onto the one that's left, right? So the one that's, that we're, we're taking down to a smaller size, we follow the same kind of methodology. There won't be a branch bark collar on that. If we're reducing the height, we're gonna prune to a lateral branch, which I'll, I'll explain in a moment. Um, but that's what a reduction cut is. It's taking the height down. Uh, proper utility pruning does reduction cuts or directional pruning. They, we're going to remove part of a branch, leave some of it this way. Sometimes we drive down the road and we see utility trees that look like this. That's actually better for the tree than if we top it or round it off. Topping creates wounds that the tree cannot heal. And what it does is it tries to generate new wood. It's got to make energy, right? It gets all of its energy from the leaves. And then what happens is it gets rot in those branches and it causes it to become even more dangerous or more of a threat to the utilities. So we wanna do it the right way. So pruning equals wounding. Every time we prune, we're creating a wound for that tree. So when you're pruning, you need to think about removing branches that are smaller. So we wanna prune them harder when the trees are young get them growing in the right direction. Um, and then as they get older, then we're gonna prune them less. We're mostly, as the tree gets older, typically we're removing uh, dead wood, mostly. Damaged uh, limbs from storms. Uh, but when trees are small, we're trying to get them off to the right start. So the idea is small pockets of decay are better than poor street tree structure, right? So we wanna have a good structure. We wanna have a tree that's gonna last for a long time. And we do that through pruning. And then the more often a tree is pruned, the smaller the decay pockets. So the more often we prune it, we're not taking as much of the tree off, right? As many of the branches out. So we do a little bit all the time. So the tree on the left, the picture on the left, that is an example of co-dominant leaders with included bark. You can see the, the fissure between the two leads. Those two leads are competing with each other and every year they're gonna grow in diameter. And when there's bark between them, that, that bark is not a strong union. And over time, it will split apart. So this tree, when it's small, should have had the branch on the left side taken off, right? So we can see where the branch bark ridge is. There's no collar, no visible collar on this. But we know from the picture earlier where we should be pruning that to get it to one leader. That way, this tree will form one central dominant leader and be stronger and last longer and be less prone to storm damage than the one on the left. It's also good to know the species or know general traits of the species that you're pruning. So, um, for example, if you have a tree that's elm shaped, um, it's easy to keep it raised up. We know we're going to have a big full canopy. Its elms are vase shaped. Um, if we have um, trees that are that typically are very spreading, they get really wide crowns. 
then we probably need to be a little more aggressive on pruning if it's close to a building or close to uh, a sidewalk or something where there's going to be low branches for people to walk into, uh, as opposed to, say, like um, a, a tree that gets taller with one single lead, like, a, like an oak. Um, we just remove small branches as it grows, but if it's a maple and it's it's more of a spreading species, then maybe we got to look at taking off a bigger limb on that one side. So it's important to know what you're trying to accomplish. The other thing that we want to do is remove suckers and water sprouts. Um, typically, these just uh, grow into the tree. They do generate a little bit of food for the tree, but they also cause other issues. So um, sometimes this is caused by stress. Uh, sometimes it happens with trees when they're transplanted. Um, some trees, it's very common for this, especially like fruit trees, apple trees, very, very common. So um, they grow from um, dormant buds called epicormic buds, and um, mostly they grow straight up. So they're not forming regular branches. Um, it's just something that we should remove, um, especially, like I said, it's a, it's a big problem with apple trees, crab apples, a lot of fruit trees. Sometimes um, branches die, maybe they break off, maybe not. But if we have a dead branch, we can see where the tree is already starting to create a collar to close that off. But it can't because the dead wood is in there. And right now there's probably bugs going in and you know it's, it's becoming an issue. So rather than going back to the branch bark ridge, we would prune to where that new collar is already formed, as opposed to cutting off the, the wound wood that's already been, been created by the tree. Does that make sense? So we just look at the tree and it tells us where we should be pruning. We also um, need to be aware of diseases. Um, if we go outside and prune today, we'll have a squirt, a spray bottle. And if we see a tree that has some disease in it, maybe it's um, Maybe it's a, a tree with fire blight, let's say. Fire blight is a, is a disease that makes the tree look like it was on fire. The branch turn, the dark bark turns black, the leaves turn black. So if we see something like that, we want to prune it out where we can, um, but we don't want to spread it throughout the tree, right? So we'll, we have some, um, some rubbing alcohol we'll spray the saw with or the pruners before we go make another, before we prune another tree. Makes sense? Um, so it's just important to, to realize that when you're out pruning, if you see something like that, maybe you should, um, you should make sure you can sterilize your equipment between, and sometimes even between cuts, depending on, on what it is. When do we prune? Well, typically most people like to prune in the winter. There's a couple of reasons why. Um, you can see the structure of the tree better. You can see the branches better. You don't have the leaves in the way. Um, once you prune a few hundred trees, you can really still identify dead branches and other things. Once you get, get used to it, um, you can still identify things that need to come off, but um, you're not dealing with as much brush. You're not dealing with as many much leaf mass, quite, not quite as much weight. So typically pruning is done in the winter when the tree's dormant. You can prune in the summer if you need to, um, but I would try to keep that minimal. Um, you know, if you have a storm and there's a broken branch, you'll want to prune that out in the summer. It doesn't matter what time of year, but most pruning happens in the fall. Um, sometimes we get the, the problem with the sap flowing in the spring. If it's pruned in early spring, um, it doesn't really hurt the tree. It's losing a little bit of energy, sure but um, it's better still to, to prune that tree and make sure we're avoiding problems later down the road, even if we're gonna have a little bit of that issue. So the five steps, number one, we wanna remove dead, broken branches and suckers. First thing, um, dead, broken branches and suckers. The second one is we wanna to try to get it to a central leader. So like the tree I showed earlier with the co-dominant leaders, that tree, we would make one pruning cut and we would be done when it's small. One pruning cut, we would be removing almost half of the crown, which is not recommended. I, typically, we want to remove about 25%. 
of the crown at the most and 25% of any one branch. So um, the idea is to um, the idea is to minimize severe pruning like that, but you can do it when the tree is small. When the tree's young, that's the time to do it. So I don't know if there's we'll see small trees out here, Chris, but that's something we can look for. And then the next one is select the lowest permanent scaffolding branch. So if we have a tree that's next to a sidewalk or next to your driveway, then we need to make sure that we, well, the tree's small enough that we get the branches off that are going to impede where your car pulling into the driveway or somebody walking down the sidewalk. And, you know, with the municipality, uh, we had to prune for 14 feet of street clearance. And everybody says, why do you have to prune for 14 feet? That tree looks stupid. And we say, well, you know, every week a garbage truck comes down your road and picks up your trash. And if we don't prune the branches off professionally, the garbage truck will. So whether it's a salt truck, a garbage truck, there's always going to be big trucks somewhere on your street, a moving truck, moving van. So the idea is to get enough clearance um, while the tree is small enough uh, as it grows take off a branch or two every year, as opposed to going in and having to remove a third of the tree all at once, okay? So that's the way we need to think about pruning. Um, then limbing up for clearances, like I said. So we establish the form, we establish the structure of where how that tree can coexist with its surroundings, with the people, with the things, the moving parts, and then um, uh, make sure we have enough clearance. So, this is an example of a broken branch in a tree. Sometimes you have to look hard. This tree, uh, the branch at the top, you can't really tell that it's, um, that it's broken from a distance, but if you get up closer, you can see it. It's got the split in the middle. At some point, that's gonna fall. The leaves are still alive on it because it still has the vascular tissue on both sides of it, but that is a very weak branch and that should be pruned out. So um, the other thing that I, I haven't talked about yet, we talked about dead branches, diseased branches, broken branches, but also crossing branches. If we have two branches that are crossing and rubbing, that creates a wound that the tree has a difficult time closing over. So we'll wanna look at those and pick the one that is the, the smallest or the least impactful to the, to the tree and take that one off. Or sometimes we can prune to a lateral branch, like I talked about with the, Subordination pruning. If we have a, a branch um, that has a, a Y on it, and we'll see this when we go outside, and this is causing a problem, sometimes we can prune it and leave the one that goes this way on there. If we, again, look at where the, the branch bark ridge is, if there's one there, and prune it in the proper place. The rule there is that the tree, the, the branch that you're leaving has to be at least one third as big as the one that we're taking off or else the tree will decide it's just not worth it. I'm not getting enough energy from this limb and it'll, it'll, it'll seal it off over time. So one third rule. Um, again here, this is uh, um, a pretty simple way to see it. Even though we don't have two codominant main leaders, we still do at the top of the tree. You can see the one on the right is competing with the one on the left and so in this case, they chose to keep the one on the left and take the one up on the right that's a little bit shorter. That's, that's a judgment call on your, you know, up to you. Um, looking at the tree visually, um, you would make that decision, which one do I want to keep? Typically, we keep the biggest one. Uh, the one that is least, is the one we remove the one is least impactful to the tree if we take it off. So these are all things that you'll see, and you you really need to you really need to get it to one liter. That's the the most important thing out of this whole training is you need to get a tree to one liter where you possibly can. Um, then we look at um, uh, lowest permanent scaffolding branch. Uh, what height does that need to be? Um, if we, we want to keep that one, then it's being shaded out by smaller branches or ones that aren't as important. We can free it up. We can take off those other branches and keep the one that we want to be the lowest limb on the tree. And then we also want to have um, the trees um, radially arranged. We don't want to have all the branches on one side of the tree as much as possible. 
So when you're pruning, you need to think about three-dimensionally also, not just vertically, but, but also the radial arrangement of them. And we wanna keep the branches at least 18 to 24 inches apart as we prune. Um, most trees, it's much more than that. So, but if you have like a crab apple tree or something, the idea is to try to keep them spaced vertically. Again, um, limb up for clearances. Uh, don't remove more than 25%. It's tough sometimes, especially like if you have a small tree that's in the, in the tree lawn between the sidewalk and curb. It has a lot of competing uses. There's people on the sidewalk, there's trucks on the street. So you have to be careful with that. Sometimes you have to make it a little more uh, one-dimensional uh, instead of radially, radial uh, because of that. But as the tree gets taller, you can start to again establish the, the canopy all the way around. So here's what it looks like with tree with leaves. This has two equal sized trunks originating halfway up into the canopy. And so we wanna subordinate one of those now and begin the process of developing a central leader. So this is it before, and this is it after. You can see the on the right-hand side, um, it's creating a void. This is um, right as it happened. Um, but the idea is to get to it as soon as you can while the tree is small and not wait until it gets too big because then maybe we're creating a, a wound this big. And that tree is gonna have a really hard time with that. If we prune it when it's this big, it's a lot easier for the tree. So this is it right after it's done. And this is it um, one year later. So you can see the tree is recovering and um, it's, it's the same tree and that's the same, same photo angle that you can hardly tell now. So sometimes, you know, you gotta just decide I'm gonna do this and it's gonna look funny for a year, but it, it grows out of it. And this tree will be here a lot longer than it would have been if it had co-dominant leaves that, that are gonna cause it to split apart. This one is too late. You can see the two, two sides are bigger than the main leader. This one, I would re recommend a basal prune on this one. So off at the ground, you can't fix this. It's gonna split apart at some point. It's, it's uh, you know, too late. And that is it for the presentation. Do we have any questions? Yes, ma'am. Um, you spoke about suckers on like crab apple trees and things. Is it better to prune them or to apply some kind of you know, liquid? Supposedly there are, um, some spray on, I, I forget the, the, the name, the trade name, but um, supposedly you can prune them off and you can spray them with a, a chemical, I, I can't remember the trade name, I can look it up for you here in a minute though, um, that keeps it from regenerating, but it's been my experience, it doesn't stop it. It, it just keeps growing. And pretty soon you get a little thicket there if it's like a crab apple or something. Um, no. You're just removing a very, very small percentage of the leaf mass by doing that. Sure. As you develop that central leader that has a co-dominant leader, right? Easy when they're smaller that size to take care of. Is there a point where you surrender when it's like way, way, way up? You know, you'd have to get a ladder or a bucket truck. Do you ever give up on that dominant leader philosophy, if that question makes sense? I guess it depends. If it's near your driveway and something could fall in your car, or it's near your house, or it's a tree that's very important to you, I would consult with an arborist, pay a professional to do it, um, and get their opinion as well. So we have um, a certification. It's called um, International Society of Arbor Culture Certified Arborist. So um, most of us in the industry are, are certified arborists. There's continuing education needed and all that kind of stuff. So we have to get recertified every three years. So it'd be good to find a professional and have them look at it. If it's in your backyard um, and if it drops a limb, it's not going to hit anything, then you know maybe you just decide it's not worth your money. Okay, thank you. Ma'am? I've seen sometimes where there, it's been pruning and there's like black on it. Is that, I think, is it tar that they put on it? Or what, why do they do that? So 
the International Society of Arboriculture does not recommend any kind of uh, cut treatment on that. Um, as I said before, there are a couple of different uh, companies that produce um, spray that helps limit suckering, allegedly, but it's been my experience, it doesn't really do anything. So um, old practices were to put tar on it, old practices, if there's a cavity to put concrete in there, and it, it's none of that is recommended anymore. weeping tree. I can picture the shape of regular trees and how you would do it, but when it comes over intentionally, how do you prune that or clean that? That is a little more, well, hopefully you've put it somewhere where you don't have to be working under, walking under it or something like that. Um, typically, you know, you don't want to remove that because that's why the tree was planted in the first place, especially if it's something like a weeping cherry or something like that, a weeping crab apple. Um, you do minimal pruning to minim to in case you have clearance issues, like if it's too close to your house or if it's coming over your sidewalk. But again, the other principles are the same: uh, remove crossing branches, remove rubbing or crossing, uh, remove uh, if it's got codominant leaders, remove dead wood, remove stubs. So the principles are the same. Just hopefully, it's planted in a place where you can enjoy the the weeping characteristics. Ma'am? Um, I just see the tree that it's going to come later, but I don't, I haven't heard anything about shrubs, and those are the ones that I have the most questions about. I'm wondering if it's a. Do we have shrubs out there we can work on? We do, yeah. There's everything under the sun around it. Follow the same skin from the old? Shrubs are a little more forgiving. Um, we're not creating, maybe we're not going outside. Um, we're not, we're not creating wounds and big branches that could fall on things or people. So shrubs are much more forgiving and there's, you know, different philosophies on it, but, um, you know, it depends on what kind of look you want. Like if you want the Disney look, you know, it's, you pretty much got to use mechanical, mechanical stuff. Um, if you want it, you know, you, you got some shrubs growing near your house and they're blocking a window or something you just reach in and, and prune and with the hand pruners and and uh, drop it down to where it should be. Ma'am? Like that, right in the middle and it fell out. And so now we have a tree that's like this and it's hollow in the middle. Um, it's been a couple of years, it looks weird, but does it matter? It, if it's hollow in the middle, it's structurally, structurally, it's gonna, it's not gonna be very strong. So if it's near something it could fall on, then it could be a problem. If it's in your backyard, middle of nowhere, it's not an issue. It's not hollow in the middle, sorry. It got chopped off, I hit my light. So there is no middle. So it's only the two white spots. If it's not, if it doesn't have decay in it, then, um, it could still be a reasonably strong joint without the middle lead. That would be something for an arborist to look at. I think if you if you're worried about it, if it's somewhere where it doesn't have a target, then it's probably not an issue. And have you heard about the that was on the ash trees that's no longer on the ash trees but has moved to another tree? No, uh, it's it's emerald ash borer. And it only feeds on on ash, on fraxinus. So um, it's still here. No, there's still people treating. Um, there's still ash around. Uh, it didn't kill them all, which is a, a great thing. Um, there's people doing research on genetics, trying to find resistant uh, resistant cultivars, resistant blends, hybrids. Um, it's going to be here as long as we have ash trees. And um, what happened was it burned through most, you know, 90, 90 plus percent of all the ash trees. And um, um, so the population has just crashed, but it's still here. It's still feeding on them. And um, we still recommend people really want to keep their trees that they should continue to treat them to protect them.
You're one of the lucky ones. Somebody told me it moved to a fringe tree. No, it it doesn't it doesn't re, it doesn't complete its life cycle in fringe trees. It it's been found in them. It, they're both in the uh, ash and fringe tree are both in the olive family. Um, so it 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 kind of likes it, but it doesn't doesn't complete its life cycle in it. It just yeah, it bores in and then that's it. It's a D-shaped hole. It's it's uh, maybe not even an eighth of an inch across D-shaped pole. And it, when you see a dead one, you peel off a piece of the bark, you can see the galleries where they've been feeding. So are there more questions? Did you? I'm curious if you'd be able to take a minute to review the relationship between the collar and the ridge. Yeah. Let's go back to the line drawing. We have a few questions on Zoom we'll get to also. Okay. The um, questions you all ask the better. That gives the rain longer to. Yeah. The, the back edge is about 10 miles over in India on the radar. But. So <laughs> the ridge typically is looks like like this. It's it's rough wood that usually sticks out just a little bit past um, past this crotch right here, this this joint. And the line drawing I think shows it pretty well. And if we go outside, we'll we'll see it. We'll point them out. And then the collar is visible on a lot of species. Some it is not. Okay, but if you look at that that plane right there, the the plane where it's pruned. Um, if there's not a collar, but we can identify the ridge, we want to be just outside of the ridge and still prune on that general plane. So what that angle may be, uh, it's, it's not 45, maybe it's 40 degrees, something like that um, angle. So it's something you got to see. I should have probably should have cut a couple of branches and brought them in and passed them around. So you could, I could have marked it with a marker or something, but hopefully we can go outside. And if we can't, maybe I can throw on my rain jacket and run out there and prune off a couple of branches and bring them in. We'll see. We'll do something like that. Did that answer your question? Okay. Anybody else? Main, um, and I guess I mean most of the ones I've seen around here are more bush form. Um, if you go down south, they're they're bigger and they they try to get them to one liter, especially if they're along a road or something. I would treat it more as a shrub. I think here, yeah. Other other than rubbing or crossing branches, you want to get those out: diseased branches, broken branches. Chris, you want to read a couple? Yeah, so uh, let's see. We have one from his name is Bill Thal, it looks like. Uh, he was re referencing back to people needing to know the characteristics of the tree. Aren't some of aren't some trees, which aren't there some trees that do not have central leaders, is this question? Yeah, there's some that aren't as strong central leader as others. Um, but if you still see co-dominant you should remove one of them. So even, even if it's not a strong apical dominant central leader species, we still wanna have branches that are have strong unions, strong crotches so that they don't fail over time. So that, that principle is still the same. It's just gonna look different when you get there to prune it. And then Carol Wilkinson asks, should we have trees periodically checked by arborist? And if so, how often? If it's somewhere near where there's a target. So for example, um, a property owner, and generally a property owner has the responsibility to be a good property owner, meaning that they should walk around their yard and at least look at their trees periodically to make sure there's not something dead that can fall in their neighbor's house or a big dead branch over the neighbor's driveway or whatever. Um, they aren't expected to be 
to be able to see things that an arborist would catch. If you have trees that you suspect have issues, or if you have trees that are extremely large or have a lien that could affect somebody else's property or yours, or you know, you have a you know a, a swing set in your backyard and there's kids playing back there all the time, I would recommend that you have an arborist look at it at least periodically, maybe once every five years or something. And then if you notice a change or if you have a big storm, then maybe call them back. That's that's the question. Okay. Sir? I think I heard you mention that you don't recommend topping. Trees. No, no. Topping creates um, wounds that in places where there's not a branch bark ridge or collar, and the tree has an extremely difficult time healing over those wounds. What grows out is very weakly attached, um, uh, very weak wood. If you think about it, it's only going to have a couple of growing seasons. So the more growing seasons, typically the more rings and the stronger the branch is. So what happens is it gets rot and then it drops branches and it's, it actually starves a tree. The idea is to remove about 25% or less when you prune each time. Sir? Still not real clear on when to cut the ones that have gotten pork off. Look at that illustration up there on the bottom, the, the one in the middle, the bigger picture, second from the right, where the branch shoots off. Would you take that off or leave it on? That one I would probably take off. It's it's kind of a, a tight angle, and there's probably going to be bark in between the two. Okay, so, so is that kind of the rule of thumb? Is there no angle like that? <laughs> look at it and see. So the a strong crotch should look like the one on the upper right. You see how that how the the branches is, is comes off and there's there's a, a gap yeah. and there's not bark in there. This one probably has bark between the two, okay. and that's what caused it to split apart. Okay. Could could the next question? Could would there be a time to where you don't take it off but make a reduction on it? You could do that. Say it's a larger, larger if it's a bigger tree, that's, that's probably what I would do in that case. I would make a reduction cut and and uh, make it less competitive with the other one. Yeah. Yeah, I, I see that mistake made a lot. And um, and even things like people plant like river birches right next to their foundation and they get pretty big. I mean, I, you know, I would I would. Uh, I, I typically recommend people if you plant shrubs around your house and trees, at least, you know, if it's a small tree, maybe 20 to 30 feet away. If it's a large tree, at least 50 feet. Yeah. Sir? Uh, you spoke mostly about meters and dominance and so on. What about off of branches? Is it the same concept? If there's two branches that are growing too close together and rubbing or crossing, or if they also have included bark between them, I've seen it. It doesn't happen often, but I have seen it before. You try to remove one of them if you can. Um, sometimes with branches, it's a little more difficult. But um, if we, if you do have a situation where there's a branch with two two laterals that are growing out of the same kind of crotch, I would remove probably the bottom one. What if you have a branch coming off? Is it okay if I cut it two feet away from the other branch? So you have two feet left. No, you should prune it to a lateral branch that's at least one third the diameter of that one. So that's another subordination cut for a, a horizontal branch as opposed to a vertical top. Does that make sense? <laughs> Hopefully we can go outside and we can, can play around, but it, it looks pretty miserable. Oh, sir. On evergreens versus deciduous pruning, uh, is there a better time period to prune those evergreens because they have different biochemistries? I don't 
think it matters to either of you. I don't, I don't think it matters because they're, they're as, when the ground's frozen, they're not moving water through the system, but um, they grow pretty much year round. I don't think that it matters a lot. And typically for evergreens, you're pretty much just printing for clearance or deadwood. If it's deadwood, it doesn't matter for sure. If it's clearance, I, I don't, I don't think I've ever heard that it, it's an issue. I'm not an expert on evergreens, but I don't think it's it's an issue. Flowering trees. Flowering trees. It depends on the species. Um, sometimes you, if you prune them the wrong time, you don't get flowers the next year. Um, some flower on last year's wood. Some flower on the new wood. So it's important to understand which one it is. And um, I would say that's something I would probably just Google if you know what kind of tree you have um, and see what the recommendation is. Yeah, because you don't want to prune off, prune it and not have it flower for a year if possible. Yeah. Ma'am? We have a lot of giants. Do you recommend just leaving them alone and not going in? Is that arborvitae? Mm -hmm. Um, yeah, I, yeah. I think mostly people plant them for screens. So if they're, you know, if they're hitting the ground and rotting or it's killing off the branches, you probably want to prune it up a little bit. If there's dead branches, um, if they're dying where they're hitting the ground, if they're being shaded out, I would prune those out. Yeah, just because of that issue. 